Good morning again, everybody, and I hope you've had a chance to download the note sheet for today and have your Bibles handy and have them open to Psalm 71. We're going to be tracking through that today. Last week, we looked at that tragic and awful story of King David and his fall from grace with that sordid sin against Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. David's life, David's reign, was never the same after that moment. And I want you to think about what he lost for just a moment and put it in, in perspective. David's faith was so strong for so long. He was known as a, a man after God's own heart. And the Lord had fulfilled all his promises to David. And, and then some. Through his leadership, Israel had become arguably the most powerful nation on earth at this moment. And, and if not then, then it did uh, during the reign of his son Solomon, which followed him. David was rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, and he had plans in place to create the temple. But David's vision wasn't just territorial, it was global. You see, you, you see this in many of his psalms, his prayer that God would use Israel to reach the nations, to bring the truth and beauty and goodness of God to the ends of the earth. The dreams that God placed within David were vast and extended beyond his lifetime. And all these David threw away. All that momentum, all these dreams, all the opportunities that, that God had, had given to him to take a good life and make it great for a night of passion. David threw it out the window. So instead of spending his last 20 years on the earth, building up Jerusalem, training the next generation of Israel's worship leaders, evangelizing the nations, he spent most of his final years watching his family tear itself apart and watching seeds of civil war begin to take root within Israel. And then he spent a good chunk of time running from his son Absalom as a fugitive, when Absalom challenged him for his throne. It goes without saying that David did not finish well. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. How do we honor God for all our days? How do we blaze across the finish line of life and, and faith rather than spin out or flame out or, or burn out? It seems like every month or so I, I hear yet another story of some pastor or worship leader of note who has fallen into great sin like David, or cashed in his Jesus chips and said, I'm done. Well, Psalm 71 is going to give us some insight into this. Now, most of you in our church are young. You have more years ahead of you than behind you. This is an important message for, for you to hear. Just like we're hoping for a vaccine to come along to save us from this coronavirus, I want you to look at this week's message. And then next week as well, there's, there are actually going to be two parts I want you to see this as a vaccination of sorts, to protect you, to keep the virus of sin at bay in your life, and, and, and doubt and unbelief. We don't know who wrote this psalm, there's, there's no author uh, there, but uh, most scholars say it's David, and I agree with them. The uh, opening words are identical to Psalm 31, which was ascribed to David. The pattern of this psalm follows the patterns of Psalm 42 and 43 which David wrote. The life setting matches his situation. The writer has fallen from some position of greatness, which he enjoyed and has, has, has fallen into despair. And right now he's got many enemies that are on his heels and he's being mocked. He's also an older man who knows now that the clock is ticking. And yet he wants to recover from this, this failure of his. And he wants to leave a, a mark on the next generation for good. And like David, the author of this psalm, has a strong, passionate faith. And he believes that God will turn his life around before it's over. That all is not lost. And so as he writes this psalm, we can unpack these, these various lessons about things that we need to, hold to take to heart if, uh, if we're going to finish well. So let's, let's dive in with this. And here's truth number one. You cannot make sense of life or navigate its many twists and turns without Christ. Notice the opening uh, paragraph as David pours his heart out to God. Verse 1, In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. This is a favorite prayer of David's. He uses the exact same words in Psalm 31.1. Something similar to this in Psalm 16.1. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Now it's a little late for David uh, to be saying, God, I don't want to be put to shame. David has already done that. He's brought shame on himself and on God with what he's done. But don't miss this. 
Even though he has failed, even though he's, he's broken God's heart, he doesn't run from God. And this is usually what, what we humans do. We mess up. We blow it. And then we blame God for it. Proverbs 19 verse 3 says this. You should jot this verse down. Proverbs 19 verse 3. When a person's folly brings their way to sin, his heart rages against the Lord. A year ago, a uh, Christian pastor and writer, uh, Josh Harris, Known for being an advocate for purity, he wrote a culture-changing book back in the day called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Well, Josh Harris pulled a David, committed some kind of sexual sin, had some kind of affair. We don't need, need, uh, know the details, but it doesn't matter. But did he imitate David in repenting and running back to God? Well, no, he didn't. Of course not. He was too proud for that. Can't be my fault. Had to be God's fault. And so you know what he did? He kissed his marriage goodbye. And then... He kissed his Savior goodbye. He renounced Christianity. Lovely. But see, that's what we do in our sin and in our pride. David, though, runs back to God. Runs back twice as hard. It's one of the qualities that made him a man after God's own heart in the first place. That no matter what he faced in his life, his first instinct was to seek God. We see this all over in David's life. Lord, Lord Saul's hunting me down. What do I do? I'm seeking you. Lord, I'm going to battle. What do I do? I'm seeking you. Lord, I'm king now. I need wisdom. What do I do? I'm seeking you. If only the night of his great sin, he had said, Lord, there's a beautiful woman over there and I'm tempted. What do I do? Help me. I'm seeking you. One moment of failure, though, and all this happened. But this has always been David's habit. And amazingly, he does it here. After this, this great sin of his, okay, God, I've blown it. I accept your discipline, but what do I do now? I'm seeking you. In you, O oh Lord, do I take refuge. Verse 2, in your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. This is an interesting verse in his earlier Psalms. And this is what's cool about uh, the Psalms. David has written so many of them that we can actually track his spiritual growth from his earlier Psalms to his later. In some of his early Psalms, he would appeal to God to help him on the basis of his righteousness. Psalm 18, which we looked at earlier in this series, David writes, The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. My righteousness. He's so full of himself. But no more. It's God's righteousness to which he appeals. Lord, help me. Not because I'm so good, but because you're so good. And that's a sign that you're starting to grow up spiritually. When you begin to think that way and you begin to pray that way. Verse 3. Be to me a rock of, of refuge to which I may continually come. I love this. And this is one of the things that you need to understand about following Jesus Christ. There is no place where we come to in our lives where we say, okay, Lord, I'm good. I think I got it from here. Uh, I'll check back in with you later. That's not Christianity. That's not how this, this works. This is not a religion where I, I check in with God one hour a week and then we're good the rest of the way. No, this is a relationship which I pursue daily. Hourly even. Every hour. I need you. And that's what David is learning here. That's what we need to learn. So, true or false? I have a statement for you. You tell me right now if it's true or false. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do only a few things. Is that true or false? And the correct answer is... Bah! It's false. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do... Nothing. It's like Moses said to the people of Israel before he died, the Lord is your life. And David has come to a point where he knows this. In Psalm 16, he says, he says to God, apart from you, I have no good thing. And so if you want to navigate the twists and turns of life and finish well, then you have to decide right here and now, is Jesus telling the truth here or is he lying? And if you decide that Jesus is telling the truth here, then you need to decide here and now. Will I make Christ my number one pursuit? Will I seek Him daily? Will I walk with Him continuously? Will I practice His presence? Will I pray without ceasing? This isn't just a, a, a mystical thing. It, it's, it's developing the awareness that when Jesus said, I'll be with you always to the end of the age, He meant it. And so throughout the day, we circle back to Him with our lives. 
having a heated conversation with your spouse. You, you talk to him. Lord, help me. Help me to listen. You, you come to that place in your day at work where that old adage is true. You know, where work expands to fill time and clutter expands to fill space. Don't you hate that? But it's true. You hit that point in your day and you say, Lord, help me. Give me wisdom to sort this out. You're sick. You say, Lord, give me strength. You, you encounter a situation of need. You say, Lord, show me what to do. Show me how to help. You, you see a beautiful sunrise or a sunset or something that's, that's magnificent. You say, Lord, I thank you for that. You're around a difficult person. You say, Lord, give me grace. You're the difficult person. You say, Lord, give me grace. And this isn't a weird thing. This doesn't make you a religious wacko. You, you don't dress funny or act funny or talk funny to, to do this. It just becomes a normal, ordinary part of life, as natural as breathing. And you just keep up this conversation day after day and season after season. You just keep talking to the Lord until that day comes when you look up and there he is standing right in front of you. And you go, oh, I'm home. You're the one I've been talking to my whole life. You cannot make sense of life. You cannot navigate through life's twists and turns without Christ. In you, O oh Lord, do I take refuge. Well, truth another, number two that comes through in David's psalm here. This world is shattered by sin. And there is no living in it without suffering. This world is shattered by sin and there is no living in it without suffering. This is a truth we need to know if we're going to finish well. In verse 4, David's prayer shifts. He says, rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the, the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. Deliver me, for you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. After what David did to Bathsheba and to Uriah became known, his uh, favorable ratings plummeted in the opinion polls. And in time, his son Absalom, who was a, a piece of work, David's family was a piece of work, he, uh, Absalom fed into that discontent, and he actually became a, ri a rival to his father, and went after his throne. And, and it's a long, awful story as well. But at its apex, David actually had to, 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 to run from his throne, flee Jerusalem to save his life. There's a story about how he's leaving Jerusalem and some people just parade, uh, paraded beside him on the street, kicking up dirt at David, mocking him, spitting on him. David says in verse 7, I have been as important to many. The Hebrew word there means monster. An object of ridicule. This is what I've become, David says. It's like we said last week, David got away with nothing. With this, this great sin of his. In some ways it would have been better if he had died. And so throughout the rest of this psalm, he mentions these enemies of his. The suffering he's going through. Verse 10, for my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together and say, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him. There is none to help him. In the very last verse of the psalm, for they have been put to shame and disappointed who sought to do me hurt. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to suffer exactly as, as David did, but we will suffer. We are a fallen race and we live on a broken planet. It's a cursed planet to use the Bible's language. Creation is groaning, scripture says, and we are too. There's no escaping it. And you and I cannot live life well, and we certainly can't finish well, until we get our brains wrapped around this. I had the misfortune uh, back in college of getting involved with one of those churches which, which promotes something that is, is called the health and wealth heresy. The idea that if you just have enough faith, that you'll never be sick, and that you'll experience financial prosperity, uh, pr uh, prosperity, and you won't suffer. You'll just have victory after victory. You'll go from triumph to triumph in your life. Having grown up in churches that were largely dead and lifeless, when I encountered this, I was drawn to it, the idea of, of a faith that was that powerful and that real. And I dove in uh, for a, a year or so. But like any cult group does, you know what this church did, and there's a lot of churches like that around. You've got to be careful. They, they take all the verses of the Bible that do talk about, uh, you know, walking in victory and health and blessing, and there's all kinds of scriptures like that. But what they do is they leave out all the verses that say, we're going to experience struggle and heartache and sickness 
and adversity as well on this side of heaven. <laughs> you just throw all those verses away. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 11, 33 through 38 is a, is a classic example. And if you've got your Bibles, just flip there real, real quick. In this very famous chapter, it's called the Hall of Fame of Faith. The writer praises a number of great heroes uh, in, in the Bible. And in verse 33, he, he says, These heroes, quote, through faith conquered kingdoms, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And I can't tell you how many times we heard this passage preached in this church, and, and, and the, the preacher would, would just rev us up by going line by line through this, and we'd shout out, Praise the Lord! Amen! Me too, Jesus! But then he would always stop with this line of women received back from the dead. Uh, they're, they're dead by resurrection. And then one day, I read the rest of this chapter for myself. And I was stunned. Because here's how it read. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Everybody say, Amen! Come on, we're going to be together again next week. And we've got to start practicing this. Women received their dead by resurrection. Come on! Amen! Praise the Lord! And then very next sentence, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Can I get an amen? amen. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. Praise the Lord. They were stoned. They were sawn in two and killed with the sword. They went about in skins and sheep and goats, uh, the skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. As you can imagine, this rocked my world. And then about the same time, a very famous Christian singer, in fact, he was the, probably the most influential Christian musician of, uh, of his generation. This is back in the 1980s. His name was, was Keith Green. And he died in a uh, horrific plane crash, small plane crash on his ranch in Texas. It's killed about a dozen others, including some friends and a few of his own children. That for me was my JFK moment, my 9-11 moment. You know how people say they know where they were when they heard that JFK was assassinated or the, the planes went into the Twin Towers? This was, this was that for me. When I heard that Keith Green died, he, he was that important to me. I'll never forget that moment, how awful it was. And that, that rocked my world also. And then this happened at the same time I was going through that psoriasis debacle I told you about a few weeks ago where my church had convinced me that it would be a great act of faith to throw my medicines away. And I did that. And the outbreak of psoriasis on me grew all the stronger. I got infection. I almost ended up in the hospital. Well, as I went through all these things, I began to put the pieces together. I began to figure things out and get my thinking on straight. And I learned that the teaching of, of these health and wealth, prosperity, gospel churches was not biblical. It was unbalanced. It was very misleading and at worst destructive. We're seeing some of these same things today with the coronaviruses. There are groups that say, you know, just have faith. Throw away the mask. Don't worry about social distancing. God will take care of you. There's a word for that in the scripture. It's putting God to the test. For he calls us to be stewards and to know the laws which he set up that govern this world. Now there's power in our faith to be sure. Yes, people get healed. There, there's all kinds of, of exciting things that following Jesus brings about. That, that uh, dead lifelessness of my, my childhood church, that's just as destructive. That's just as misleading. I discovered that Jesus was alive. The Bible's living and active, just like it says it is. Christianity is the most amazing thing. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But friends, we live, the, we live out the, the reality of this living faith in a world that is shattered by sin. The Apostle Paul says that we have this treasure in jars of clay. That's how, that's how we're described. That's how our bodies are described. We're like jars of clay. Picture, you, you might even have one by you right now and look at it, how fragile it is, how easily chipped it is. We're all cracked pots. Turn to, turn to those you're sitting with right now. Again, let's practice this. And say, you're a cracked pot. I didn't say crack pot. Don't say that. We're all cracked pots. And all of this means that suffering... It's part of the deal. 
Something that, that we followers of Christ must face. In, in fact, especially followers of Christ. Because there's a suffering that we endure as, as, as believers in Christ that other people in the world don't have to experience. Persecution and trials and troubles that come specifically because we love Jesus. You cannot live life well. You cannot finish well unless you have a biblical understanding in your heart of suffering. Without that in place, every time something harsh comes along or hard that comes along, you'll cop an attitude with God. You'll start questioning and doubting and howling and whining and why me? And you'll be bringing down everybody with you. It's time for you to grow up if that's you. Like David, we need to respond, learn to respond to problems with praise. Here's another reason why David was a man after, after God's own heart. His reflex was to seek God in every situation and he responded to problems with praise. You see it in the psalm. Look at verse 4. The problem. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked. Very next verse. Verse 5. The praise. For you, O oh God, are my hope. Verse 7. The problem. I have been as a portent, a monster, to many. Very next verse, next sentence. But you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Verse 13, the problem. May my accusers be put to shame and consumed. Verse 14, the praise. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. The world is shattered by sin. And there is no living in it without suffering. Learn it. Love it. Live it. Well, you don't have to love it. But, pick up your cross and follow hard after Jesus. And you'll finish well. Truth number three, and we'll fin finish on this point and pick up next week uh, the, the, the rest of this psalm. But here it is. Our lives on earth are short and come in seasons. Well, this psalm just gets lovelier and lovelier, doesn't it? you know what? This is proof that the Bible treats us as adults and not children by speaking to us truth that we need to hear. And this is a big one. This is an important one. Now, assuming David to be the author here, we clearly see evidence that he's coming down in the home stretch of his life. He thinks back to his childhood in verse 6, upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. But now he realizes that sand in the hourglass is dwindling. Verse 9, do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. And realizing that the clock is ticking, David wants to go out strong, especially in light of his great failure. Verse 17, O God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those who come. Now, you might be thinking, PBC, how can thinking about the seasons of life and the shortness of life be good for me? Sounds kind of morbid to me, actually. Reminds me of that, that scene in the movie, What About Bob? I don't know if you remember that. A great movie with Siggy. He just turned seven, little Siggy, and he's in, in bed, and Bob's there, they're camping, and Bob's across the bedroom, and he's in bed, and, they're, and, and, he, and Siggy says, we're all going to die. I'm going to die. I was just six yesterday. And then, and then Bob's all bug-eyed looking at the ceiling right there. Some of you are thinking that way. That's what this psalm is like. But the fact of the matter is, it's highly beneficial for us to think about our mortality. And the psalms, <laughs> they're always trying to bring our attention to this fact. Teach me, Lord, to number my days, says Psalm 90. Psalm 103, I'm trying to memorize this one right now. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. In the Middle Ages, God's saints would often have skulls, actual human skulls, on their desk or on their bookshelves. And, and, and they were there to remind them that life is short. They did, that they didn't have all the time in the world to get things right. Now, I don't own any skulls uh, or have any on my desk, but I have had four pictures that I have hung on in, in my offices over the last few years. And, and uh, I brought these over here to uh, the community center. There are a series of four paintings by a wonderful painter named Thomas Cole from the 19th century Hudson School uh, of Artists. And the first painting is, is uh, 
is called, and, and, and we'll show these, uh, I'll show these in the, in the video. Want to look at that? First one's called uh, simply uh, Childhood. And it shows a, shows a baby in a boat. And the, the scene is bright and innocent and, and cheerful and full of life. He's getting ready to embrace life. And the second painting is, is called Youth. And, and here he's, he's now a young man. And, and it's still bright and colorful. And there's a castle in the clouds. It's time to be chasing down your, your dreams. And it, and it fills you with hope and optimism of what's to come. The third painting is called Manhood, and you see now the scene is, has gotten dark, the skies have grown dark, and it's no longer a quiet stream, but dangerous rapids now appear, and the man is looking mainly up right now, as he's losing hope fast. And the final painting is called Old Age, where now the skies are completely dark, except for one, one burst of light, one shaft of light, and, and that's all the man is looking at, for that's where his hope is right now. These, uh, these paintings are my skull reminding me that life is short and I don't have all the time in the world and I need to make adjustments accordingly. And not only is life short, but it comes at us in seasons. This is another truth that we have to remember. There's a time for everything under heaven, the Bible says, a season for, for every activity. If you really want to uh, screw up your life, anybody want to screw up your life? Raise your hand right now then uh, <laughs> forget this truth. And the thing about seasons that you have to remember is because it's a season and we know it's coming, they can be predicted and prepared for. You don't wait till winter to cut your firewood, right? You don't wait till summer to plant your garden. Hurricane season has just begun. Now, if you live on the coast, you don't wait till the storm is right there to buy your plywood and your supplies. That's the thing about seasons. And David knew that a, a new season was approaching him. When his physical strength would be gone, uh, he says to God, forsake me not when my strength is, is spent. And as I've thought about the passage of time over the years, it's, it's my thought that uh, these seasons come in spurts of roughly 20 years. You talk about 20 being a number of completeness and, and, and wholeness. Well, you tell me if, if this preaches the first season, I've even named them, the first uh, season, the first 20 years of life, or, or your learning years. You know, where you're growing and, exp and exploring and, and experimenting, discovering new things. The second 20 years are, are what I call your launching years. 21 to 40, the prime season for launching your career, your family, and your future. The third season, the next 20 years, are your leading years. 41 to 60, where you're at the height of your physical and emotional and intellectual powers. And so run hard, run strong in this season. But then the fourth season, 61, ages 61 to 80, are the losing years. For your losses are starting to mount. You've lost your kids. The nest is empty now. They're in their own launching phase. The loss of energy, the loss of help, the loss of air. <laughs> the loss of friends and family as death begins to nibble away at the orbit of those you love. Sounds all bad, but we need to say, that biblically speaking, spiritually, this can be the most fruitful season of all. The righteous still bear fruit in old age, the Bible says. They are ever full of sap and green. <laughs> it's the Psalms again, Psalm 92, 14. Are you starting to get the idea that, that you should be reading a lot of the Psalms? Paul said to the Corinthians that though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed every day. Ah, the losing season is a wonderful season for God's saints because more and more of our attention and our energy and time is spent attending to the Lord. These years should not be wasted. And then, if you have, have the strength, if you make it that far, 81 on to eternity is the longing season. It's the season where you're longing to go home, longing to rest from your labor, and your sufferings too, and enter into your heavenly reward. Because life is short and these seasons go by just like that, we need to think it through and adjust our life around those truths. I've journaled most of my life, and, and, and I used to think that if I paid close attention to time, you know, and by writing about it, that maybe I could capture some of it in a, in a bottle or even slow it down. And do you know what I've learned after 20, 30 years of writing? Nope. Can't do it. 
You can't slow it down. You can only savor it, milk it, redeem it, like the Bible says. Redeem the days, redeem the time, for the days are evil. And that's the joy of writing, because we do forget things. It was recognizing the shortness of life and the seasons of life that fueled my desire to step away from ministry a few years ago when we were up in Connecticut and, and, and sell our house, move to California and trust God to reinvent our lives entirely so that I could write for a good long season. You know my story, most of you. But all that happened because I looked at my watch one day and, and, I, and I realized that if I didn't do this when I was solidly in my leading season, that I was going to be that guy on my deathbed tossing in regret when he realized that for fear's sake he had never he never attempted great things to finish well you have to take Christ's hand and allow him to speak to you through his spirit and teach you to use time well and speaking of time our time is up so we're going to leave Psalm 71 for now and we're going to pick this up next week uh, and we'll continue this talk together Face to face. That'll be great. I can't wait to see some of you. I know we're all going to look different with our COVID haircuts. and Some of us have our COVID-19. But it'll be special.